Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Monday, February 1st uh, Trust Ambassadors meeting. I'm your host, Christian Walters, and uh, we're going through that article, or the uh, treatise there on the uh, trust. Let's see if I can find it now. The uh, Practical Treatise on the Law of Trust by Lewin. And we're still on the first volume, and we're still on the first 20 pages. So, well, let's see. Where did we leave off last week? Uh, we just talked about, I think, on page 3. I think we're going over that example at the top of the page. So um, I think we'll just do like a cursory review for a little while, uh, read through this, and then we'll come back because you know, we'll pick up here where we started again. But uh, we'll, I think we'll just try to run through the first 20 pages, get through with that under a cursory read. But on page 3 then, we're starting there on page 3, under privity as regards to the key use. So that would be the, uh, we're going to start. Do I not want to? What's that? Page page 3, page 3 has the uh, privity as regards to the city key use. So with respect to the Christian? city key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt here. Um, Pete's trying to get on and he says uh, the site's offline. And um, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Site's offline? I yeah, I don't know if there's anything uh, you can suggest. I tell him that he's trying to get on. I just want to let you know. I'll meet out now. Okay, thanks. So privity as regards to the city key use or the city key trust or the beneficiary trust. So with respect to the city key use, the principle upon which the whole estate depended was also what in legal language was denominated privity. And privity under Black's law was to have knowledge of. So thus on the death of the original city key use, the right to sue the subpoena was held to descend indeed to the heir on the ground of, and there's a Latin term here, heroes adem personam cum ancestoror. So I suppose that's to the heirs under Latin terms. But the wife of the city key use or the husband of the femme city key use and a judgment creditor were not admitted to the same privilege. For their respective claims were founded not on privity or knowledge with the person or as the nexus or the relationship with the trust of the city key to use, but on the course of law. So it was privy of, privy of knowledge with the person versus the common law, really. And for the like reason, a use was not assets, was not subject to forfeiture, and on failure of heirs in the inheritable line, did not as cheat to the Lord. Man, we, we, could, we could spend all tonight just talking about that right there. Tying that in with the last part of the paragraph above, jumping back. About uh, one, two, three, four, five, five lines in, where it talks about so the Lord who was in by his cheat, a deceiser, an abater, an intruder, were not amenable to the subpoena for the first claim by title paramount to the creation of the use, and the last three were seized of the torturous estate and held adversely to the fiofi to uses. Tying that in with privity of regards to the beneficiary trust. And, and we could spend probably a, a good day talking about that. So continue on the next section, bottom of the page three, special trust defined. The special trust, for here too we have spoken of as a simple trust only, simple trust only, was where the conveyance to the trustee was to answer some particular and specific purpose as upon trust to reconvey in order to change the line of deceit, deceit upon trust to sell for payment of debts. I don't know what that little NC is right there, though. So a simple trust only. Simple trust only. And you might want to go to the W8BEN, the W8BEN instructions. W8BEN instructions. You've got on block three of the form, talks about a simple trust. Simple trust. Now, why is a modern form like the IRS using and talk about simple trust? And at the bottom here, we're talking about special trust. For a couple pages earlier, we're talking about simple trust. So on page two, where it's talking about trust simple or special, and then simple was defined. But here the IRS is using a simple trust in their W-8 Ben form. So continuing on, in the special trust, the duty of the trustee was not as in the simple trust of a mere passive description, but imposed upon him the obligation of exerting himself in some active character for the accomplishment of the object for which the trust was created. And in case of trustee neglected his duty, the SETI key trust 
was entitled to file a bill in chancery or bill in equity and compel him to proceed in the execution of his office. And it says CA, the case on the reign of the Henry II appended to the Sugden of Powers, number one. Now the next section, trust applicable to chattels, or really it's trust applying to assets because applicable is applying to and chattels are assets. So it's trust applying to assets. So both the simple trust and the special trust were applicable to chattels real and personal as well as to freeholds. And freeholds are an estate and land held in fee simple, in fee uh, tail, or in for the term of the life. And the second definition under Black's eighth was the, the tenure by which such an estate is held. That would be freeholds. But continue on. But the trust of chattels, the trust of chattels now, trust of chattels versus the freeholds. But the trust of chattels were, for obvious reasons, much less frequently employed. They didn't use that much too back then, I guess. The amount of the property was small, and the owner, even without the interposition or the defense of a trustee, had the fullest control and dominion over it, and the chattel interest as it followed the person was equally subject to forfeiture, whether in custody of a trustee or in the hands of a beneficial proprietor. But to the extent, whatever it was, to which trusts of channels were adopted. They were administered upon the same principles, mutantis, mutandis, and were trusts of freeholds, and the right to sue the, a subpoena turned equally on privity, NCC there, Williams Case 4th Institute 87. And the interest of the city key trust was held not to be assignable, not to be assignable, which brings me right back to the Declaration of Independence where it says that our rights are unalienable. Or in other words, unassignable. It makes you wonder why. But I deduce immediately from that that when something is not alienable, it's a trust. It's a private trust. If it is alienable, it's not. But since we're operating since post-1933, where everything's flip-flopped, here we have a statutory trust supposedly operating on alienability, transfer of title. So the statute's affecting trust. Let me expand upon that real but the statutes affecting trust, such was the nature of trust as they stood at common law, at common law. But the manifold frauds and the mischiefs to which the new system gave occasion, particularly the great usury and trouble arising thereby to purchasers, called loudly from time to time for the enactment of a remedial statutes. And one of the most important of these was the first Richtertude third uh, C section one, and the substance of which may well be expressed in the terms of their preamble so that all acts made by or against a city key use should be good as against him, his heirs, and free offs and trust. In other words, that all dealings with the city key use with the trust property should have precisely the same legal operation as if the city key use had himself possessed the legal ownership. And to what interest the legit, uh, legislature intended this statute to apply has not on all hands been agreed. So a fee hoffment and fee to uses was clearly the case primarily intended. Upon a fee hoffment and tail, it seems no use could have been declared, for the tenant and tail was incapacitated by the statute de Donis from executing estates. So with respect to a fee hoffment for life to uses, there appears to be no reason upon principle, except far as the language of the act may be thought to furnish an inference. And certainly there is no objection to the score of authority. Why the city key to uses might not have passed the legal estate by virtue of statutory power. It has been contended by Mr. Sanders that on a free offment for life, no use grafted on the life estate could have been declared. And remember, declaration is one method of formation of trust. And on the ground that the tenant for the life held of the revisioner, the consideration of tenure would have conferred a title to the beneficial interest on the tenant for life himself. But his reasoning can have no application where the estate for life was not created, but was merely transferred. For then the assignment of the life estate was not distinguishable in this respect from the conveyance of the fee. In each case, there was no consideration of tenure as between the grantor and grantee, but in each case, the services incident to tenure were due from the grantee to a third person. Number one, see that. So it is clear that the statute embraced uses of lands only. It did not extend either to special trusts 
or to trust of chattel, not the special trust, because the trustee combined in himself both the legal estate and the use, though compelable in chancery to direct them to a particular purpose, and not to trust of chattel, because the preamble and the statute were addressed to city key to use and his heirs and to fiopes and trust. Page 6. So 27 HS section 10, the mischiefs of the system increasing more and more the statute of Richard occasioning still greater evils than a remedy from the faculty it gave to the city key to use and its fiofi, who had now each power of passing the legal estate of defaulting by collusion the bona fide purchaser, the legislature again interposed its authority by 27 Henry VIII, section 10, and thereby annihilated, annihilated the uses as regarded their producer or character by enacting that where any person stood seized of any hereditaments uh, to the use, confidence, or trust of any other person, or of any politic body politic, such person or body politic as had any such use, confidence, or trust, could be deemed in lawful season of the hereditaments in such like estates as had in use trust or confidence. See number one there. Now special trusts and trusts of channels accepted from the statute. So uses by the operation of this statute became merged in the legal estate, but special trust and trust of channels were not within the purview of the act. The former, the special trust, because the use as well as the legal interest was in the trustee, and the latter, the trust of chattel, because of turmoil, is said to be possessed and not to be seized of the property and the introduction of the modern trusts. In the t room of the uses were thus destroyed, as they arose, the judges by their construction of the statute, the construction of the statute, the construment, created a novel kind of interest since distinguished and now known by the name of trust. Before the statute of Henry VIII, a person to have had the complete ownership must have united the possession of the land and the use of the profits. The possession and the use were even at common law recognized as distinct interests, though the city key to use was left to chancery for his remedy or equity. And on a free offment to A, to the use of B, to the use of C, the possession was in A, the use in B, and the limitation over to C was disregarded as surplusages. So when the statute of Henry VIII was passed, it executed the estate in B by annexing the possession to use, but having such become functus officio, it did not, as the act was construed affect the use over to C. However, chancery, now that uses were converted into estates, decreed C to have a title in equity and enforced the execution of under the name of a trust and CB. Hopkins versus Hopkins. Next section. Land, use, and trust distinguished by Lord Hardwick. Interest in land, said Lord Hardwick, quote, thus became of three kinds. First, the estate and the land itself, the ancient common law fee, and secondly, the use, which was occasionally a creature of equity, but since the statute of use, it drew the estate and the land to it, so that they were joined and made one legal estate, and thirdly, the trust, of which the common law takes no notice, no notice, but which carries the beneficial interest and profits in a court of equity, and is still a creature of that court, as the use was before the statute, and still is today trust not within statutes relating to uses. Thus, newly created interest was held to be so perfectly distinct from the ancient use that the statutory provisions by which many of the mischiefs of uses have been remedied as the 19th Henry 7, section 15, by which uses had made liable to writs of execution, and the 26th Henry VIII, section 13, by which they had become forfeitable to the crown for treason. Forfeitable to the crown for treason were decided to have no application. However, the trust took the likeness of the use, conforming itself to the nature of special trust and trust of chattel, which had never been dis disturbed by any legislative enactment. So the trust at first modeled after the pattern of uses. To show how the principles of uses prevailed after the statute of Henry VIII, it was held in the reign of Elizabeth that the equitable term of the femi convert would not vest in the husband by survivorship for a trust, it was said, was a thing in privity and the nature of an action, and there was no remedy for it 
but by writ of subpoena. And in a few years after the same reign, it was resolved by all the judges that a trust was a matter of privity in the nature of the choose and action, and therefore was not assignable. And in the sixth year of King Charles of the First, it was decided by the judges that a femi was dowerable at act or rule of law, and a court of equity had no jurisdiction where there was not fraud or coven. And the widow of a trustee was not bound by the trust, but was entitled beneficially to her dower out of trust estate. Next section of improvements introduced by Lord Nottingham. But during the reign of Charles I and Charles II, and particularly during the chancellorship of Lord Nottingham, who from the sound and comprehensive principles upon which he administered trust, had been styled the father of equity. The courts gradually threw off the fetters of uses and, disregarding the operation of merely technical rules, proceeded to establish trust upon the broad foundation of conformity to the course of common law. Quote, in my opinion, said Lord Mansfield, trusts were not on a true foundation till Lord Nottingham held the great seal, but by steadily pursuing from plain principles trust in all their consequences, and by some assistance from the legislature, a noble, rational, and uniform system of law has since been raised, so that trusts are now made to answer the exigencies of families in all purposes, all purposes, without producing one inconvenience, fraud, or private mischief, which the statute of Henry VIII meant to avoid. Next section, alterations made in trust as regard to trustee. As to the changes that were successfully introduced, it was held with reference to the trustee that actual confidence in the person was no longer to be looked upon as essential. A body corporate, therefore, was not exempted from writ of, repl- or, excuse me, writ of subpoena on the ground of incapacity. B and even the king, notwithstanding his high prerogative, was invested with the character of a royal trustee, though the precise mode of enforcing the trust against him was not exactly ascertained, to use the language of Lord Nottingham, Nottington, quote, the arms of equity were very short against the prerogative, unquote. The subtle distinctions which had formerly attended the notion of privity of estate were also gradually discarded. And thus it was laid down by Lord Hale that tenant and dower should be bound by a trust as claiming and per by the assignment of the heir. And so it was afterwards determined by Lord Nottingham. And if and when an old case to the contrary was cited by Lord Jeffreys, Jeffreys, it was unanimously declared both by the bench and the bar to be against equity. And the constant practice, a tenant was statute merchant, was held to be bound upon same principle, for he took, as it was said, by the act of the party and the remedy which the law gave thereupon. But as to the tenant, by the courtesy, Lord Hale gave his opinion that one in the post should not be liable to a trust without express made by the party who created it, expressing the trust. And therefore, tenant, by the courtesy, could not be bound, but his lordship's authority on this point was subsequently overruled, and courtesy as well as dower was made to follow the general principle. Next section, as regards to city key use trust. With respect to the city key use trust or the person entitled to you know, the narrow doctrine contained under the technical expression of privity began equally to be waived or rather to be applied with considerable latitude of construction. In other words, broad construment or misconstruement. The equitable interest, said Justice Roll, is not a thing in action but an inheritance or chattel as the case may fall. And when once the trust, instead of passing as a truce in action, came to be treated on the footing as an actual estate, it soon drew to it all the rights and incidents that accompany property at law. And thus the equity of the city key to trust, though be bar, uh, bare contingency or possibility, was admitted to be assignable. In Winningham's case, that a husband who survived his wife could not, for want of privity, claim a equitable chattel, was declared by the court to be no longer an authority. So a judgment creditor, it was held by Lord Donningham, might prosecute an equitable fairy facious, and though Lord Keeper Bridgehan, Bridgman refused to allow an equitable uh, legit, it was probable, probable had the question arisen before Lord Nottingham, his lordship would in thus, as in all other cases, have acted on a more liberal principle. At all events, the creditor's right, relief, thus respect, 
have since been established by the current modern authority. And again, in trust was decided by Lord Nottingham to be assets in the hands of the heir. And though Lord Guilford, however, held the other way, yet Lord Nottingham knew the subject. Uh, if you're not speaking, could you mute out, please? And Lord Nottingham. Uh, Lord Guilford afterwards held the other way, yet Lord Nottingham's view of the subject appears to have eventually established. Courtesy also permitted of the trust estate, though the widow of the Sesti Key Trust could never make her title to dower, not said Lord Bansfield, unreasonable or principle, unreason or principle, but because wrong determinations had been sled in too many instances to be then set right. Or rather, as Lord Redsdale thought, because the admission of dower would have occasioned great inconvenience to purchasers. A mischief in that case of courtesy was not to be equally apprehended. Next, Lord Bansfield's doctrine, principles governing trust at present day. Lord Bansfield was for carrying the analogy of trust to legal estates beyond the legitimate boundary. Quote, a use or trust, he said, was therefore understood to be merely as an assignment, or excuse me, an agreement by which the trustee and all claiming from him in privity were personally liable to the city key use, and all claiming under him in like privity. Nobody in the post was entitled under the, or bound by the agreement, but now the trust in this court is the same as the land, and the trustee is considered merely as an instrument of conveyance. And in the application of this principle, his lordship argued that the estate of the city key trust was subject to a cheat, and that on failure of heirs of trustee, the lord who took by a cheat was bound by the trust. But to these proportions, the courts of equity were never yet sented. The limit to which the analogy of trust to legal estates ought properly be allowed was well enunciated by Lord Norting Northington in the case of Burgess versus Wheat, quote, it is true, he said, this court is considered trust as between the trustee, city key to trust, and those claiming under them as imitating the possession. But it would be on a bold stride, and in my opinion, a dangerous conclusion to say, therefore, this court has considered the creation, the instrument of trust as a mere nullity, and the estate in all respects, and in same as if it still continued in the season of the creator of the trust, or the person entitled to it. For my own part, I know no instance where this court has permitted the creation of a trust to affect the right of a third person. That is, to illustrate the principle by instance, a tenant by the courtesy or endower or by legit as claiming through the city key use, or excuse me, city key trust or trustee, though in the post is bound by and may take advantage of the trust, but according to the doctrine laid down by Lord Nottington, the Lord who comes in by his cheat is not in any sense a privity to the trust, and therefore can neither reap a benefit from it on failure of heirs to the city key to trust, nor is bound by the equity on failure of heirs of the trustee. And that ends the introductory view. Next we have part one. Part 1, Definition, Classification, and Creation of Trust. Chapter 1, Definition of Trust. Definition of Trust, as the doctrines of trust are equally uh, applicable to real and personal estate, and the principles that govern the one we found mutus mantis to govern the other, we cannot better describe the nature of the trust generally than by adopting Lord Cook's definition of a use, the term by which, before the statutes of uses, a trust one of lands was designated under A. A trust in the words applied to the use may be said to be, quote, a confidence reposed in some other, not issuing out of the land, but as a thing collateral annexed in privity to the estate of the land and to the person touching the land for which the Sestiki trust has no remedy but by subpoena in chancery. So, number one, a confidence. It is a confidence, not necessarily a confidence expressly, reposed by one party in another, for it may be raised by implication of law, and the trustee of the estate need not be actually capable of confidence, for the capacity itself may be supplied by legal fiction, as where the administration of the trust is committed to a body corporate. But a trust is a confidence, as distinguished from just in re and just ad rem, for it is neither a legal property nor a legal right to property. Two, reposed in some other. It is a confidence reposed in some other, not in some other than the author of the trust, for a person may convert himself into a trustee, but in some other that the 
city key use or city key trust for as a man cannot sue a subpoena against himself he cannot be said to hold upon trust for himself if the legal and equitable interest happen to meet in the same person the equitable is forever absorbed in the legal and thus if a be seized of the legal inheritance is ex parte paterna to the equitables ex parte materna upon the death of a the heir of the maternal line has no equity against the heir of the paternal and the same rule prevails as to lease lords for lives so as if the legal estate in a freehold lease is be vested in a husband and his heirs in trust for the wife and her heirs the child who is the heir of both takes the legal estate ex parte paterna and the equitable estate ex parte materno will be by merger of the equitable and the legal because seized became seized of both at law and that equity ex paterna ex parte paterna and the subsequent devolution from the regenerated uh, regulated accordingly so how far the equitable merges in the legal estate but this rule holds only where the legal and equitable estates are coextensive and commensurate or if a person be seized of the legal estates in fee and have only a partial equitable interest to merge one in the other might occasion an injurious disturbance of rights and thus before the fines and recoveries act if lands had been conveyed unto and to the use of a and his heirs in trust for b in tail with remainder to trust for a in fee had the equitable remainder limited to a been converted into a legal estate it would not have been barred by a's equitable recovery next section in what sense mortgage e in fee is trustee for himself and his executors executors in the case of a mortgage e in it in fee it has been said that a man and his heirs are trustees for himself and his executors but the meaning was that until a release or foreclosure of equity of redemption the interest of the mortgage was the nature of personality and passed on his death to personal representative the heir therefore took the estate upon the trust for the executor a release or foreclosure unless it happened to be in the lifetime of the mortgagee becomes too late after his decease to alter the character of the property for as the tree falls so it must lie next page 16 next section trust not issuing out of the land but collateral to it a trust is not issuing out of the land but as a thing collateral to it a legal charge as a rent issues directly out of the land itself and therefore binds every person whether in per or post whether a purchaser for value valuable consideration or volunteer whether with notice or without but a trust is not part of the land but an incident made to accompany it and that not inseparably but during the continuance only of certain indispensable adjuncts for number 4 annexed in privity to the estate a trust is annexed in privity to the estate that is made stand or fall with the person by whom the trust is created as if the trustee be deceased the torturous fee is adverse to the impressed with the trust and therefore the equitable owner until the fusion of law and equity could have not himself sued the deceaser but must have brought an action against him at law in the name of the trustee that ties in what we're reading on gilbert some place i remember that got to bring an action the beneficiary brings an action against uh, whoever through the trustee next section an extent of the term privity to the estate during the system of uses and also while trusts were in their infancy the notion of privity of estate was not extended to tenant by the courtesy or in dower or by the or by legit or in fact to any person claiming by operation of law though through the trustee but in respect to and in its respect the landmarks have been carried forward in the respect this the landmarks have been carried forward and at the present day a trust follows the estate into the hands of everyone claiming under the trustee whether in per or post and it was the opinion of sir t clark and lord nortington that the lord taking the estate as claiming to title paramount and not either in per or post was not affected by any privity and therefore could not be compelled to execute the trust but this question was never actually decided and has in great measure become immaterial it's 17 number 5 trust annexed in privity to the person a trust is annexed in privity to the person to en- entitle the sesti key trust to relief and equity it is not only necessary that he should prove the creation of the trust and the continuance of the estate supporting it but should also establish that the assign is not personally privity to the equity and therefore amenable to the subpoena if can be shown that the assign 
had actual notice, then whether he paid a valuable consideration or not, he is plainly privy, privy to the trust and bound to give it effect. But if actual notice cannot be proved, then if it be volunteer, the court will still affect him with notice by presumption of law. But if he be a purchaser for value, the court must believe until proved to the contrary that having paid for the estate was ignorant and at the time he purchased of another's equitable title. A purchaser for valuable consideration without notice, therefore, is only a sign against whom privity annexed to the person cannot at the present day be charged. Privity annexed to the person cannot at present day be charged. Six, no remedy of the city key to trust but in chancery. The city key, use, or city key trust has no remedy but by a subpoena in chancery. And by chancery must be understood not exclusively the court of Lord Chancellor, but any court invested with an equitable jurisdiction as opposed to common law courts. The spiritual courts, neither of which until the fusion of law and equity had any cognizance in matters of trust. A common law court could never, from the defective nature of its proceedings, have specifically enforced a trust. But at one time it affected to punish a trustee in damages for breach of the implied contract. An exercise of authority, however, clearly extra-provincial and afterwards abandoned. Had a spiritual court attempted to meddle with a trust, the court of the Queen's Bench might have been moved to issue a prohibition. 36 and 37 uh, V, section 66. By 36 and 37 Victoria, comment 66 and 37 and 38 Victoria, section 83, it was enacted that as from 1st November 1875 inclusive, there should be one Supreme Court of Jurisdiction, or Jurisdicator, consisting of Her Majesty's High Court of Justice and Her Majesty's Court of Appeal, and the High Court of Justice was made to comprise five divisions, the Chancery Division, the Queen's Bench Division, the Common Pleas Division, the Executure Division, division and the Probate, Divorce, and Admiralty Division, but by order in council dated 16th of December 1880, under section 80, or section 32 of the first mentioned act, the common pleas division and the executure division have been abolished. Equitable states and rights are now to be noticed and acted upon in all courts and where there is any conflict between the rules of equity and the rules of common law, the rules of equity are to prevail. See sections 24 and 25 of the first mentioned act. Subject to any rules to be made in pursuance of the new enactments, all causes and matters pending in the Court of Chancery at the commencement of the Act of 36 and 37 Victoria are transferred to the Chancery Division of the High Court of Justice and the subject, as aforesaid, all causes and matters for execution of trust, charitable or private, are to be assigned to the same division and for that purpose, every document by which the cause or matter is commenced is to be marked for that division or with the name of the judge to whom the cause or matter is to be assigned. See sections 33 and 34. And that ends the first chapter, the first 20 pages. Boy, if this doesn't blow you away, then you must be strapped to the chair and the floor. You got the equitable state and the right to be noticed and acted upon in all courts whether there is any conflict between the rules of equity and the rules of common law. The rules of equity are to prevail. You got the higher court being going by trust in equity. You got the last say. So why don't we open up for a little bit of a question there. Uh, comments? Questions? Anybody press star six? State your name where you're from. Don't be bashful now. Christian? What do you think? Yeah, who's this? This is Mark from Mass. Hey, Mark. Go ahead. I want to go back to page, I believe it's eight in my book, where you, where you had the, uh, where they had the example of the A, B, and C, and after the end of the H statute, and that seems to be what, what, in my mind, seems to be what's going on today, where they cut the NX to A, and combined, combined it all into B, basically, our remedy, as you said, is in the court of equity. Right. What, what page is that on the bottom? Could you look on the bottom of your, your page and tell me what, what that page is? In my book is page 8. Page 8? Yes. Uh, what, what start of the paragraph? Uh, introduction of the modern trust. Uh, 
Okay. All right, what's the what's the page at the top? The that's on page six on the PDF, Kristen. Page six on the bottom. Yeah. Okay, I see it now. Yeah. Introduction of the modern trust in the room of uses which were thus destroyed as they arose. Page seven. Then the judges, by their construction of the statute, created a novel kind of interest since distinguished and now known by the name of trust. Before the statute of Henry VIII, a person to have had the complete ownership must have united the possession of the land and the use of the profits. Possession and the use were, even at common law, recognized as distinct interests, though the city key use was left to chancery for its remedy. On a theophany to A, the use of B, to the use of C, the possession was in A, the use in B and the limitation over to C was disregarded as surplusage. And when the statute of Henry VIII was passed, it executed the estate in B by annexing the possession to the use, but having thus become functionus officio, it did not, as the act was construed, affect the use over to C. However, chancery, now that uses were converted into estates or trusts, decreed C to have title and equity and enforced the execution of it under the name of a trust. And B is Hopkins versus Hopkins. Did anybody look that up? Did anybody have that case site? That might be in the uh, second volume. A lot of these footnotes, they were complaining, or not complaining, they were touting that this uh, treatise, how good it was because the footnotes were listed within the book itself. So are you looking in the volume two to find the footnotes? Actually, I did not look in the volume two. I do have it, but I didn't look at it. Yeah, volume two should contain the footnotes, and then I don't know how detailed the footnotes are, but then it might be wise to get a hold of, of some of these that they're mentioning, because some of them look to be key. Yes, I, and I thought the next two paragraphs also pretty much summed it up as well, where it ended off where pretty much had a perfect trust combined, best trust, a shadow. <coughs> Basically, no law was able to um, attach to it because it's so unique. Yeah, because everybody was coming at at law in an action as a creditor, and they got a judgment at law, but yet it does not apply to trust because a trust is an equity. So is this basically what's going on today? Uh, before I would say yes or no on that, I would have to tear that, that paragraph apart and thoroughly understand it, but it sounds like... You know, they're operating under the modern view of this, how they're stating it, under the disguise of debtor-creditor, because it's being construed, because we never expressed it to be a trust. As I was reading at the latter of this, in that second part there, I forget exactly where it was, where it says, unless it was expressed, it was going to be construed. And it would be construed broadly. So they had pretty much any way they wanted to construe it if it wasn't expressed. And that's basically what they're doing today. They're construing it to be under debtor creditor and getting everything, creating all the evidence that you're the debtor and here everything is really a trust. A trust that was never expressed. Okay, I, I, now is it this perfect trust today? Uh, the third paragraph explained where they combine different, I guess, trust into one which is so unique and set aside from the laws that it's hidden even from us. Yeah, yeah. Trust not within statutes relating to uses. Somebody else ask a question. Yeah, it says here, thus newly created interest was held to be so perfectly distinct from the ancient use that the statutory provisions by which many of the misuse of uses have been remedied as the 19th Henry, by which uses had been made liable to writs of execution, which they had become forfeitable to the crown for treason, were decided to have no application. And the trust took the likeness of the use, conforming itself to the nature of special trusts, and trusts of chattels, which never been disturbed by any legislative enactment. Apparently, they let that ride straight through. Didn't change any of that. Probably couldn't, because trusts are operating in equity. Take notice and acknowledgement with agreement that this show and or documents is private and not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for an individual legal situation or implored for making a legal decision. You will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure and is not a substitute for legal advice and or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show and or documents are for academic informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walters. By accessing or reviewing this show or using the documents therein, you understand with agreement that 
With all rights reserved without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or any other state and has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind for use by non-attorneys or pro se parties in the preparation or use of herein reference, and has no interest in any use referenced therein, and is not a party to this or any action arising from, and is only acting in an authorized capacity as liaisons to communications between the parties. By reading and or using this information, you acknowledge and agree that you are not a client of Christian Walters. These documents and or short recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached herein by reference and a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party becomes liable for admiralty commercial damages of $100 million or more per stultification or impairment per Christian Walters' discretion. Thank you for your understanding. Anybody else? Comment? Hello? Yes, yeah, so who's this, Pete? Yep, hi, Christian. Hey, I heard you had some trouble getting hey. on. Yeah, it was a bit mishmashed. Yeah. Not as much trouble as understand what the hell you were talking about, though. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, it's just so mazy, isn't it? You know, the the word structure of the sentences. Uh, well, I think part of the difficulty is in, you know, they use arcane words that we are not familiar at all with, and that's part of the big problem, I think. It's like you got to have a Black's Law under each arm, one from present day and one of, say, the first Black's edition and around 1800s there to comport with this article in order to make any heads or tails out of it, but that's after you spun yourself around about six times and hopefully you can still stand up. <laughs> you must have about eight arms. <laughs> the, uh, the, the sort of question that I want to bring is, and it does comport to the statute of uses, kind of, but it's this um, line that, you know, we need to draw between statute land and real, you know, real, real time or whatever. Yeah. Sub I, I, substance. Have you guys been studying that? Statute of uses over there? Well, kind of, because it was, it was repealed, wasn't it? It only lasted about two or three years and was just like seen as a bit of a joke because it was a uh, Henry VIII's attempt at, you know, poking his nose in other people's business basically because he was so greedy. So it didn't, uh, it didn't run too long then? No, that, that's what I've read on the history of it. Um, he he done it because he wanted to, you know, collect taxes, like, and, and these trusts were all over the place. And he, and he wanted to bring out a statute that could, like, bind people to pay him money. And I, I think it's somewhere around that time that he starts beheading his wives, you know, because he wants the, um, we call it moolah. <laughs> Which would be the, uh, the money. He wanted the money, you know, from the dowries. But it sounds like what they're doing today under the disguise of, say, debtor-creditor. Yeah, yeah, it's all the same thing. You know, they're just money-hungry, aren't they? Money and power-hungry. It's, uh, it's what they do. They invade, like. So maybe that it, it fact that it died there during that time, but yet it was revived under a different name, but was the same definition, really, functioning with a different name on, on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are other statutes I was reading. Um, actually... I might be able to just find it fast in my new book, Lord of Trusts and Equitable Obligations. Do you want me to get back to you? Someone else got a question. No, you go on. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, well, um, you know, the use is just more, nothing more than the rents or fees, and they're trying to get you a debtor under the use. Yeah. Just so they could transfer the property. Yep. Sorry, so they could transfer the property. Yeah. What else do you have? I think it might be this one. It's the Trusts of Land and Appointment of Trustees Act of 1996. Because here in England, in the last 10, 10 or so years, we've had more statutes than any other time in the history of the world. I think it's that one, the Trusts of Land and Appointment of Trustees. And that was in 93? 96. 90, 1996? Yep. And why do you suppose they en enacted that? Well, what they keep doing, I mean, like, you've got, like, the Trustee Act, and you've got the Trustee Delegation Act, the Trustee Investments Act, Trusts of Lands and Appointments of Trustees Act, the Variation of Trusts Act, you've got the Sesta K, or the Sesta K V Act, you've got the Wills Act, you know, the Wills, the so Soldiers and Sailors Act, they're always trying to make it more concise and more comprehensive. More teeth to it. 
Yeah, because you know these families who are running the place, they've got they've got children who need jobs, so they need to keep writing. Well, I think we need to take it all back and get the teeth back in equity. And I think with a thorough understanding of how equity uh, has been operating and how it can operate once we know and understand it. So, okay, then let's take you back to the statute of uses. Are you saying that is the statute where they've brought equity into statutes? Uh, well, I think not to construe the 1880 treatise here when they're talking about statutes. Uh, I think at the even at that time, I think the statutes were solely for fiction, where the you know the real man still is operating with you know rights, title, and interest. Well, if you're going to work on that assumption, then surely um, the civil law, you know, as it was born, wherever it was born, would you know set up trusts. I think I got it back to about 89 BC so far in in Roman law specific. Clear back to 89. 89 BC, yeah. Well, BC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what, that was my understanding that civil law was from the Roman era. And that's where your fictions come in, isn't it? Yeah, because they were used fictions. Rome to capitus diminish to diminishing of the status by capitalization of the name. Now the. The sort of the thing that I got from reading uh, parts of the stuff about when the Normans came, they brought with them civil law, and you had the two, um, you had the English customary law of common law running side by side the civil law, and they kind of happily went along together. Then you had um, trusts popping up and getting spotted by the king, and he brought out the Queer Emptores Act of 1290, which is still still stands today. So yeah. when was the first use of trust in England? Well, 1200s. 1200? Mm. That's where, you know, the, you know, when it's like a will in test date or whatever you call it. I think the first one in America here was the Massachusetts Land Trust. Yeah, so, you know, again, that takes us back to the, the history of how England was at the time. Um, they were using what's known as Old English, and then it became Middle English when, when the Normans came, and now you know, much of the old English is being taken away, and, and they're the words, aren't they? And it's been encroached upon by the uh, the Latin, or the, you know, the sort of Latinized version words, rather than the Germanic or the Teutonic words. Mm. Uh, whatever which way it is, we're getting user fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that earlier today, and that, that's a Roman civil law term. Well, I think it's pretty interesting that this the whole rise or origin of the trust stems from what they say in here is, you know, fraud. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. That was the whole premise of the first starting out there. Usey Freck, Roman civil law. A right to use and enjoy the fruits of another's property for a period without damaging or diminishing it. Although the property might naturally deteriorate over time. In Roman law, the usufruct was considered a personal servitude, giving a real right. In modern civil law, the owner of the usufruct is similar to a life tenant, and the owner of the thing burdened is the naked owner. That sounds like a tapeworm. <sighs> usufructus is the right of using and enjoying property belonging to another, provided the substance of the property remain unimpaired. More exactly, the usufruct was the right granted to a man personally to use and enjoy, usually for his life, the property of another which, when the usufruct ended, was to revert intact to the dominionist or to his heir. And it might be in the, for a term of years or even if it was extended by, ended by death. And in the case of a corporation which never dies, it says, Justin fixed the period at 100 years. A usufruct might be in land or buildings, a slave or beast, a burden, and in fact, in anything except things which were destroyed by use. <laughs> and isn't a use of trust? <laughs> so I, the reason, of course, being that it was impossible to restore such things at the end of the usufruct intact. R.W. Leeds, Roman Private Law, uh, C.H. Ziegler, Editor, 2nd Edition, 1930. Christian? Yeah, Rhonda. How are you? Tired. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, you know, Saturday night we was talking about whether we was heirs. 
<clears throat> or not. <clears throat> if I may just read to you out of uh, Galatians, uh, starts chapter three, verse twenty-nine. It says, "And if ye be Christ, then are then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise." Chapter four. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, different nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Uh, even so, we, even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God Christ. Amen. Wow. Does everything have breath, praise the Lord. So, does the straw man have any heirs? No, I was, I was referring to the uh, declaration, the private side. Yeah, that's where all the real rights are, the right title and interest, yeah. But under the yeah, agreement, I mean, since nobody expressed the trust, they're saying the straw man that dies yearly has no heirs, and therefore they can take it by his cheat. And, you know, it it seems to me that, that the time has come, because it, it says but uh, back in uh, chapter 3, verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up uh, unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. And that's the way I see it, that he, he revealed it. And now we just have to, here it starts uh, between verse 7 and verse 8 on chapter 4, faith and the law. How be it then, when he knew not God, he did service unto them which were by nature of no gods. But now, after they have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Yeah. <laughs> Go back into that debtor creditor stuff. <laughs> Let's <think Yeah>. trust. <laughs> so, you know, really, I guess for each of us, it's an individual thing as, as an expression of our faith. Because without faith, it won't be revealed. We're, 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 without the faith, we're still children. Yeah, and faith is confident. Living by faith. So it depends what, what you have your confidence in. On Fidei, I was looking at. I was looking at some of the um, like religious law forms, you know, that make up the inns of court in England, which would be barristers, like where the barristers uh, take their exams. I don't know what your American equivalent is of barristers. But it's Liars. Kind of take the bar, bar exam, yeah. Yeah, because generally, like, we have solicitors, and then a barrister would be more like high court action, I suppose. I'm not too sure. Okay, yeah. So what it amounts to anyway is that the Inns of Court, which is a place in London, has four inns, and you've got the uh, Lincoln's Inn, Gray's Inn, Inner Temple, and Middle Temple. And um, I was looking at the, the Inner Temple, which is of direct origin to the Knights Templar, and I was relating it to law and how it's been built, and it says that, you know, it was taught by ecclesiastical people, and it's come from religion and everything like that. Then you look at what the British royals have done um, with Henry VIII, where he separated from the Pope. And I looked at some of the different types of Protestantism, because I always thought there was only sort of like, you know, Protestant religion or Protestant version of Christianity without realizing that, you know, the royal family seemed to be following a specific, which is Calvinist or Calvinism. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, somewhat, yeah. Yeah, and it, it looks to me like a really horrible, scary, um, highly disciplined and strict form of Protestantism, where it's saying that, you know, any child who's fell from God has no right to be in or around God, and, you know, the ones who are still with God, probably by their own vote, um, get to run the show, and there's basically 45 million of them. Kind of a small crowd. Yeah. The world world got plenty of space to breathe in. Chris, can I have a question? Yeah, Donna, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could just uh, go into that um, where you said when something is unalienable, unalienable, um, it's a private trust, and when something is lienable, it's not a trust? Yeah, it could be a, a statutory trust. I think the Founding Fathers, were, they started out, be, they said it was unalienable being a private trust, but now they've construed it to be alienable under the modern view, and now they switch it to a protective trust and a discretionary trust, which under their rationale was supposed to be better than the spendthrift trust. But it was still under statutory law. So a statutory law says it's alienable, where equitable law back in 1776 said that, you know, it was not alienable. It was a private trust. 
know, under the international law, the Hague Convention, I think it was Chapter 2, Article 6, I believe, uh, said that the grantor has the right to set the law form. I want to establish the law form in my expression of trust, you know, depending whether I'm playing a statutory realm or not. If I don't, I'm going to set it for, say, 1776 or play 1776 in, in chambers. I could come on the, you know, on the public side and, and come in through a statutory trust if I thought I could uh, win that way. Just recognizing, you know, that the trust, even though they say it's a trust, has got some differences to it, whether you're on the black trust, which is statutory, or whether you're on the white trust, which would be private. Anybody else? Anything else? Yeah, if, I, I uh, wanted to ask you, um, oh, go ahead, Rhonda. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, say we're getting, you know, uh, titles and uh, trust property, notices, declarations, whatever we have to do with a particular trust, whether it be a mortgage trust or, or the birth certificate trust or the Social Security trust, and we assign uh, an RA number. All the documents in that particular trust have an, a particular RA number associated with them. Uh, take, for instance, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, when we go to, now if we attach an allonge onto that and just basically, be, basically what we're doing is becoming a, a signer onto Declaration of Independence. Right. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that how you would view that? Yeah, probably we could do it as a group and everybody could sign on to it. Well, yippee. When are we going to do that? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I got the faith, baby. That faith, that's, that's the beginning, right? What it just said right there, you have the faith, that's the way. Right, right. You have the faith, you, you become a son and not a servant. I'm in. I found out You're on really a declaration there, you were talking about, you know, were you taking that someplace? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, Declaration of Independence, we got an R, one particular RA number that we've already canceled, that we own, that we, all the documents are associated with that RA number. Now, we go to mail off the Declaration of Independence. Is <clears throat> the RA number on the outside of that envelope going to be different? Uh, yeah, the mailing, the, the mailing RA number would be different, say, uh, than the one that I'm going to use to claim the document itself, make it special and unique with that number by itself. Okay, so all the documents of the trust have an RA number, and then you're, of course, going to have a separate RA number when you mail whatever documents you need to mail. Right, right. Okay. Another question? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yes, can I, can I, have a, can I ask yeah. my question? No, no, yeah, go ahead. Statement or whatever? Yeah, okay. you want to... Um, I, uh, okay, as a notary, I have found some, um, legislation that's, uh, inactive right now, but, uh, the financial institutions are trying to pass a law where, uh, notaries cannot do presentment anymore, or only the, the financial institution can do them. And, um, I really believe that we do use as, do, or use as much of our power as we can because, um, I know that notaries in Florida are actually, we are deputy court clerks, and, um, we can actually sign off on subpoenas. We don't have even have to go to a freaking judge. So I I really put myself out there, and you know I've had my power shut off like 13 times in eight months. My phone's always messed up. I mean I know I'm getting really screwed around with, um, but that's fine because you know I just I just really want to help other people as much as possible. But um, I wanted wanted to bring that up to you, Christian, about um, you know the deputy court clerk thing. And see if you feel that there's anything that we can we can use that for in a way that would help the group and everyone as a whole. And um, so I just wanted to wanted to throw that out there and just you know if you could think about it and uh, maybe you or Lisa get back to me or you know I I would be absolutely willing to explore that. But um, I also wanted to say that I think it's really really important that um, you know if there's any way possible that uh, the more people that become notaries the better because you know th there is really a lot of safety in numbers there there really is I mean I have financial institutions furious with me but uh, I don't care because I, I do consider myself my brother's keeper and my sister's keep too so um, but it would be nice to have a little bit of help <laughs> so that's pretty much what I wanted to say and I'll mute out now thank you well I think the real power comes in the understanding when we know how to uh, take all the power the court of equity has to offer. You know, it's, it's not so much that we have to wait until something is done to us before we start saying, hey, you know, uh, here's a subpoena. No, uh, we have a court of equity that we're not even exploring the fact that a court of equity operates to enforce somebody to compel them to not breach the trust to not breach the trust. 
That is more powerful than the fact after they breach the trust, you're going to make them, compel them to do the duty that they breached. No, before they get out of the line, you got the big stick to hit them in the head, break that two by four over them and say, if I got your attention, a court of equity has that power. And we're not even thinking about that yet. And I like to bring up the fact that, say, under the UCC, which is debtor-creditor, but that's what they're using to operate with, under 4-103, where it talks about the variation by agreements, where just about anything goes by a variation, where it says the rules for varying the effect of the act by agreement and the limitations to this power, this 4-103 states the specific rules for varying the act, Article, uh, excuse me, Article 4 by agreement, and also certain standards of ordinary care. So it's like, you know, you can't get these banks and all these guys to do anything. You're not coming at them right, because through a court of equity, you sure can, because it would be lack of good faith, as it specifies under the official comments here, that their responsibility is for its own lack of good faith or failure to exercise ordinary care and may not limit the measure of damages for the lack or failure, but this section like 1-1023 approves the practice and parties determining by agreement the standards by which the responsibility is to be measured. So, with the lack or absence of the special instructions, the action or non-action consists with, consistent with the whatever rules and the like or with a general usage not disproved by the article, it's prima facie constitutes the exercise of ordinary care. And then going on, it says under 5, it says the subsection D in the line with the flexible approach requires for the collection process or the enforcement process is designed to make clear that the novel procedure adopted is not to be considered unreasonable merely because that procedure is not specifically contemplated by this article or by agreement or because it has not yet been generally accepted as the standard usage. So changing conditions constantly calls for new procedures and someone has to use the new procedure first. And number six talks about the measure of damage for failure to exercise the ordinary care. And it says, finally, if bad faith, on a bad faith is established, the rule opens to allow the recovery of other damages whose proximateness is to be tested by ordinary rules applied in comparable cases. And continuing on, it says, before the damage rule of the subsection becomes operative, though, liability of the party and some loss to the customer or the owner must be established. We've got all the power. We just don't quite know how to or understand how to use it yet. Christian? Yeah, Pete? That brings me to a point of, you know, United States and not United States of America, but the United States is held pretty much by United Kingdom. So we look at United Kingdom and then, you know, go into who the United Kingdom is, and it's the House of saxe coburg gotha of which the House of Windsor, which is the royal family, um, is a, well, on Wikipedia, it is a branch of the German House of saxe coburg gotha Now, saxe coburg gotha belongs to the House of, uh, pronounced Vettin, but it's a... Uh, spelled W-E-T-T-I-N, and, you know, they're bona fide, um, like, feudal houses, if you like, if you look at the history of them. Uh, the House of Vettin is a dynasty of German counts, dukes, prince, electors, and kings that once ruled the area of today's German states of Saxony. So, should we be dealing with them direct in a private capacity? Administratively, yeah, I would say you could... You know, everything is operating under trust and equity on the private side. But I don't know how yeah. your courts are structured over there, like your, you know, like over here we have like the courts in chambers, uh, for an in-camera hearing, but then really we don't really have to have that. We could come in under the treasury directive and, and call it, uh, dib hearing that way. We have that master file where the U.S. Attorney's Manual says that everything in that master file has got to match up with everybody else. So it's like the master file controls everything, and I, I don't know how your your structure is over there for the, something like that. Is there like a well, master file that everything is, you know, they're getting you to volunteer as a, as the trustee or the as the debtor or the defendant in a, in a breach of trust? 
yeah, it's going to be the same thing, you know, roughly speaking. But what I'm alluding to is, um, you know, actual people who we should be dealing with. Because if we're dealing with their sort of like cronies or their workers, then, you know, are we going to get where we need to be? You know, which is in, in, the, in the hive of things, like, which seems to me to be these houses of such and such families. Yeah, but I can't point out that, you know, uh, the, the first thing to achieve is to achieve uh, standing so that we have a, a, a power position where we're giving our authority from. So once we've proven the trust, you know, that where it stands, where that's where the power source comes from, the authority comes from. Now, now we've got the right to say, okay, now we can negotiate with these people because we have equal standing with them. Yeah, because they've obvi- they're obviously like invaders. Yeah, they're the lords. Uh, and even as real people, they no longer have the ability to, because it would, wouldn't be within their character to be over top of those that, you know, uh, just like it was saying in this, I think it was on page two here, page three. So the Lord who was in by his cheat, he was a deceiser, an abater, an intruder, were not amenable to the subpoena for the first claim by title paramount to the creation of the use. And that was tying it back uh, on page two to the, were talked about the confidence in the person, and they were talking about the personal confidence, but the corporation could not stand cease to the use, for it didn't have a soul, nor was it competent for the king to sustain the character of trustee, for it was not thought inconsistent with his high prerogative that he should be made responsible to his own subject for the due administration of the estate. So it's like, okay, I don't care whether or not you're a real being, you don't have standing, even as Lord. And if you are going at it with a corporation, a corporation can't have it either. It has no soul. So either way, it looks like we win-win. It's just, okay, how do we prevent them from not enforcing this crap? And then if they did breach, then how do we bring in the equity to compel them to do the duty that they breached? But I think, like I said, the bigger power comes in before they do something. We've got the bigger stick. We can compel them not to breach the trust. I mean, if they're going to pull the rug out from underneath us, we have the power through equity to come in and say, no, you can't do that. And we can prevent them from doing that. Yeah. But it's like, how does Toby the slave become, you know, the master when everybody's thinking, you know, he's still Toby the slave, he's just acting like a master. How do we really achieve the standing through the trust, get that position to where all the leaves of the trees and the issues die because we pulled the main root out, and now we're standing on... A rock. Any thoughts on that? Kristen, you just make so much sense. I mean, you <laughs> absolutely make so much sense. I, I, I just wanted to tell you, I, I really appreciate you and Lisa so very much. You really opened my eyes to an incredible amount of excellent information. And I really appreciate uh, you guys inviting this because um, I, I feel like my IQ is just, just skyrocketing. I just can't think enough. I just want to tell you that. that I think. Well, thanks for all the kudos. Any any comments on that, Pete? That we're no. I'm just reading about the uh, the royal house. The accession of Elizabeth to the throne brought up the question of the name of royal house. The Duke's uncle, Lewis Mountbatten, advocated the name House of Mountbatten, and he always wanted to have a, the British sort of royal family under his house name. And the Queen's husband is living in exile from his original country of Greece because he was kicked out, basically. Um, however, Queen Mary, Elizabeth's paternal grandmother, heard of this suggestion. She informed the Prime Minister Winston Churchill who himself later advised the Queen to issue a royal proclamation declaring that the royal house was to remain known as the House of Windsor, which is under the House of Saxe, Coburg, Gotha, and there under the House of Vettin. So, you know, the House of Vettin actually exists. And I just wonder, you know, who we should be dealing with directly as, you know, consul, envoy, extraordinary, diplomat, however you want to call it. Well, you know, if they're but operating as fictions or corporations, or even as... as uh, Feudal lords. Yeah, uh, really, it's the grantor who has the say so. Okay, I probably yeah. need to toy with that a bit in my mind a little bit more. It's like we're trying to ask them for permission to do something. No, I think it's the other way around. I think we need to command, direct, and order them because they're the servants, not us. I think we've been so brainwashed that we got this 
small mentality that this elite group of red blood, so to speak, is running the whole show. we got to bow down to them. I believe it's the other way around. I think our founding fathers, when our Declaration of Independence was written, that basically said that all men are created equal, like Lincoln said, and we're endowed with specific, unalienable rights. Life, liberty, well, property. That thought, wow. didn't just, that thought didn't just pop up in the heads from nowhere, did they? <laughs> no, there are no thoughts that just pop in anywhere. They're, they're given to you by God, but anyway. <laughs> that's what I mean, you know, that, that that's come from a root of something somewhere. And, you know, the Americans who, who set up in America were basically English people who'd had enough of all the, the crap what was going on over here and said, you know, right. you're not taking away our rights to be who we are. Right, and they were willing to fight for it. And that was the shot heard around the world. The buck yeah. stops here. And, okay. and yet, somehow, the British still wormed the way in. Yeah, we, we whoever. won the war but lost, lost, uh, lost the battle, I guess. Got construed under debt because we didn't express it to be a trust. I guess we didn't know enough about special deposit back then. Mm. I've got some friends seriously looking at that, thinking London, London clearing house dot clear net. In fact, there's quite a few back office bankers have been looking at some places here, Is it Temerora or something like that. Um, Do they have trust divisions? Okay, I'll look for that. <laughs> Because really, if we're going to make a special deposit or a trust deposit, we better be going to the trust department. So I'm thinking the the back office is probably the the door to get into the back office is probably the trust department. The front should know some more regular days of credit or door. Got some friends in London who are going to um, speak to some of their friends in the city and see what they come up with. Christian, have you heard of any? Uh stuff going around about the uh, WAFIT, the Widely Held Fixed Investment Trust? Uh, no, not a whole lot myself, no, I haven't. Well, I I haven't, I've, you know, I've got some of their stuff, but I haven't really dwelled into it, but these guys seem to believe that this WAFIT is the, whatever, our Social Security Trust, and he's got, a, you know, thousands of pages of stuff, uh, IRS uh, codes and stuff that, you know, back this up. Mm -hmm. So, because of, you know, whatever, your legal mind or whatever, I, I think maybe you might want to delve into that just a little bit. And maybe you could, that might give you, I don't know, a different perspective or might give you a, you know, open a door or two for you to, on this stuff. So they're saying that the, the WIFID is the, uh, Social Security Sustic uh, Key Trust? Is that what they're saying? Hello? Hello, is there anybody there? Christian? Yeah. Yeah, this is David again. Sometimes I noticed during your reading today, too, you, you would be gone for a couple of paragraphs and then uh, come back in. So I don't know if it's my connection or yours. Oh, oh. But but these guys have uh, definitely are, I think they're on to something. So you think that they're, uh, the, the WIFID is the SETI key trust? Is that what they're saying? Yeah, that's what they say, and he's, you know, he's, like I said, I, he's got a lot to back it up. All these codes have been gone over by a bunch of people and seem to seem to be the key to, uh, you know, so I know that uh, Ralph and some other people have are using it quite, quite frequently, apparently, to resolve, to resolve a lot of, a lot of issues and even, actually, even, I think it can be used to, uh, well, I, I don't know, I heard it, that it could be used to start issuing your own, basically, um, promissory notes or your own, but I'm not really sure about that. But it, that does seem to be right back to under debt or credit again. I think what they're doing is they're getting caught into the trap uh, where they're going to remain on the public side because I, I really think of, from what I've examined so far that this WIFID is nothing more than just a public trust. It's just like a statutory trust, even if it is the SESTI key trust because the, the front door is really you know, it's just a pass-through account into the private, so the identification on the public side is the city key trust. Now, that may be the with it, but trouble is we can't use it that way because you're commingling it back in again. It's the same thing as with these people trying to get into the DTC. If they get those funds, they're going to get all the certificates of gold, say, and all the treasury bills that are drawn against that. And they're going to be handed all those, and piled up right in their lap, and there it is. They're going to have, say, uh, $35 billion thrown at you in certificates. But certificates are nothing more than fiction debt. If they fall into the trap and they use that as money again, they will never have gotten out, and they will be farther deeper in debt than they've ever been. 
So you got to ask them for real substance, real gold and silver? Yeah, but they probably can't give it to you. That's okay. I would use it as the remainder transferred once I purged the tiles and set all the accounts down, not just including the city key trust, but I'm going to close down the foreign situs trust as well. And all of the trusts that are going to stem from those two, they're gone. The titles are all merged once I pull these two out. That foreign situs trust and that city key trust, they're gone. When I get done with them, they're going to be history. I'm going to merge the titles and all those. Now the roots pulled out, and all these other sub-trusts are all the leaves of the trees, and all that debt is going to dry up with, and I'm going to pay that past debt, or that all those present debts, and all those future debts associated with the merger. Because the merger under Section 159 and Gilbert's likens to a BOE, which is a, a payment. The merging of the titles is the payment for the debt. And that's need to worry about it. With it. With it goes with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's beyond my... Uh, knowledge and understanding so I guess I'll still I'll still keep coming to the calls and hopefully the lights will come on one of these days well it's just like you know I, I, I was the example if you draw that circle that four inch circle and then draw a line down the center you know you've got the, the public side on the left the liabilities and the pri private side on the right with the assets and when I draw the two smaller circles Inside there with the T, capital T's, which stands for the titles, and then I put on the left side, the public side, sub D, which is debt, so the titles to the debt. And on the right side, I've got the capital T, the titles to the sub A, which is assets, title to the assets. And now i got a circle up top, the straw man, and when I draw an arrow from the TD up to the straw man and the, from the, the other side from the TA up to the straw man, those titles are merged. And now... Debt is gone because it cancels out with the asset. And once that happens, then the remainder from all the assets in held in trust now get dispersed. That I'm going to disperse them, order that to be dispersed into the new trust I'm going to set up on the private side and never leaves the private side. I'm going to generate a new LLC on the public side, which is going to function as the straw man that was terminated. And that's going to tie in with the assets on the private side to be generating interest from that. And interest is to be put in that new LLC. So you create a new trust so that and that stays private where all those funds from your merged uh, government trust were put into. And then you create a limited liability corporation as your uh, transmitting utility. Right. That's the same as securitization. And that, that's going to be drawn against the foreign source private stuff private principle, and it's going to be generating interest. The interest is going to be put into that new LLC, and you're going to live off the interest for the rest of your life, and the interest can be as much as you want. So okay, you broke. Titles, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, for some reason, I didn't get the full explanation, but I, uh, he yeah. broke up a little bit, but I think I, I got the gist of it. Yeah, there was the, the uh, what was it, the one, 126, 126, 2010, uh, that Tuesday call, the first hour, I went in, in depth about that. Okay, I don't even know uh, how to get some of your recordings that I've missed. Okay, um, just very shortly. I'm about probably six hours away uh, from having everything up on the website, or at least oh. a good portion of uh, start, let's put it this way. Okay. And there was a young lady that wanted to get in, and I kind of interrupted her. Yeah, so I'll be check, keep checking back on the website and look under, as far as it is right now, it is in those... Uh, the fourth page, which is on the left there as you click on, and the fourth page is, right now is entitled uh, News. I'm probably going to be changing that to something else. I'm probably going to be changing that to audios or downloads or something like that. But right now it's, and that, it's, 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 it's News. And when you click on that fourth page, you're going to get to the new page, uh, page four of that website, and that's going to contain all the audio downlinks. Okay, and that your website is Moving Titles. Moving dot com. Uh, moving titles dot com. Yes. If you check up there now, it's not there. Although it is, it just hasn't been linked up to the page yet. But if you look on the left side, as soon as you click onto that main page there, and it pops up. It, it, the fourth page down, it says news. And if you click on that, that'll take you to another page, and it'll say it's under construction, and there's nothing there now. But as soon as I get the page up there, it's going to link to the downloads, and I've already got five downloads already up there, the ones everybody's screaming about. <laughs> okay. So anybody else have a question? Oh, by the way, then, that new LLC, you're going to get a, a new passport from that because I'm going to ask them, you know, what what do I need to come through your realm so that you recognize me? What kind of documentation do I need? 
So, Christian, are you yourself, are you pretty close to being able to merge these titles together? Yeah, I think I am, yeah. So what do you consider, what is the uh, title to the Foreign Citus Trust? Foreign Citus Trust? Well, that's a birth certificate. Now think how you would merge and terminate that trust. Well, claim it, claim the title on the one, do the one in the county and, and moving it, okay, so once we've claimed it and got the witnesses for that, uh... Well, go, go back, go back even simpler to that, you know, comes back down to really the, the basics again, right? The, the two types of titles. Identify first the two types of titles on a, on a basic. Can you give me the two first, names of the two types of titles? The special and the, uh, simple? Uh... Yeah, uh, Are you talking I'm, about I'm this, and legal? Sorry, sense like we've been doing under Gilbert's. What was that? Uh, I'm thinking more on a statutory side, like we were doing in Gilbert's. Oh, okay, on the statutory side, type title on the statutory side. Discretionary. Is that legal and, and equitable? Say again? Discretionary legal and equitable? No, no, one at a time, one at a time. Donna, what were we saying? Legal. Go ahead. Oh. Legal and equitable. You're right, that's right. Legal and okay. equitable title. Okay, I was thinking trust, not title. Uh, okay. <coughs> well, <coughs> on the... Uh, they emerge the they two think. titles in one entity, the trust terminates. Okay, well, we're holding legal easy. title because we're trustees, right? Well, now you got to just identify the two titles. Mm -hmm. Who's got the two titles? What are the two titles, or what are the two titles? We, we hold the legal title to the, if we claim the birth certificate. We hold the legal title because we're there seeing us as, trust, as the trustee, and the trustee holds legal title. Okay, what, what are the two titles? Whoever's typing, could they mute out? Uh, Can anybody the name the two titles? The birth, but the birth certificate and the SS5 application. No, no, that's two different trusts. Okay, the two titles to the birth certificate, to the to the foreign side is trust. Yep, that one alone. Where's the equitable title, what's it called, and what's the beneficial title, what's it called? Wouldn't the birth certificate be the equitable title? Their certificate of live birth be the equitable title? No, be, be more specific. Okay, the actual birth certificate would be the legal title, and the certificate of live birth would be the equitable title. Yeah, I think you're right, but you, I, I, you're not really saying the... Uh, give me another name for the first one that you mentioned. Um, well, uh... What would a birth certificate be called? Uh, certificate of live birth. Okay, certificate of live birth. Okay. So the certificate of live birth is the real man's birth certificate, and the birth certificate is the fiction man's birth certificate. Okay, so certificate of live birth is the legal title? Uh, I think it's the other way around. Live birth is beneficial title. You know, they give all the fiction titles to the trustees or the legal titles, and everybody's got a birth certificate, the legal titles, because they give them out freely to the benefit or to the uh, trustees. Not many people have the live birth certificate, which I think is the beneficial title. And when you merge with the legal in one entity, that's how you terminate that trust. So since they uh, they took the original beneficial title at birth, because they're the state seeing themselves as the beneficiary, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah, they've got it and they still got it. Because they're looking so, at all as being the beneficiaries, we, which is under misconstruement, because you never expressed it to be a trust. When we go to merge that, our legal title back to the beneficial title, that would have to go to the uh, your local department. Who would hold that? The, the state, Secretary of State would hold that beneficial title? The registrar, the county. Your local county. Right. Now, Christian, that's the, that's the county we were born in, is that right? The county you were born in, right. Okay. That. I, I didn't catch it. What did you say? How do we get? How do we get control of that? Of what? The of the of the the certificates that's held at the county. The certificate of birth. Any time the two titles are merged into one entity, the trust terminates. Where's the one title held at already? Well, I guess I hold one. Uh, as as you hold one, which one do you hold? The certificate of live birth. Well, you do. How'd you get that one? Well, I asked the state of Illinois for it, and I've got a certificate of live birth. Okay, are who are you? What is your party entity title? Uh, I'm the child. That, well, in, in trust terms. Well, I would see. I would be the trustee. Yeah. So, how can the trustee have live birth beneficial title? How can the trustee? By it was granted to me by my mother, I guess. Okay. Where where is the real beneficial title being held right now? I guess apparently in the uh, county of the state of my birth. 
Okay, now what is their party position or status? Apparently they've granted me this. Well, who do they say they are? What party? The beneficiary? Yeah, beneficiary. So you're the trustee having legal title, and they're the beneficiaries having beneficial title. Anytime when one entity has both titles in their possession, what happens? They merge, and I guess the trust terminate. collapses or that terminate. Terminate. Yeah. So if they're holding the beneficial title already as beneficiary, if I merge my title with them, it's terminated. I don't have to get a hold of the live birth certificate at all. They're holding it. All I got to do is give them the birth certificate. So it, should we? Uh... I got to uh, instead of give it to them, I'm going to I'm going to uh, transfer it to them. I'm going to move the title. Should we, should, we terminate that, should we terminate that trust before? Should there be a sequence of events that we do? Uh, We're going to have all this stuff all at once, and it's going to be done like all at once. Okay. So we just need to get everything ready to move. Yeah. Uh, what we would do on our first step would be to put the, uh, uh, what would we put in first? Declaration of Independence. Uh, not yet. Uh, before that. The claim. The claim. No, no. We want to. We want to. We want to stop the halt the proceedings. And what's the proceedings halt called? The stop. Uh, we're being uh, prescribed. Yeah, we're being prescribed. What halts a, pr a prescription? Notice. Notice of what? No, that we're here. That we're going to pay the debt. Yeah, acknowledgement of debt. Look it up. Black's law. Acknowledgement of debt. Quote unquote. Acknowledgement of debt under Black's Law edition says stops prescription. Now, right, we talked about that last week, that that's the first thing we need to do till we get this other paperwork done. Right. Is to put them on notice, to put an estoppel to all this stuff going on. Right. Are we are we going to do that notice as a, as a group as well? Are we just going to take, you know... The no, I think we'll do that probably individually. We could do that individually? Yeah, because I'm going to claim a prescription stoppage or estoppel on the prescription... Uh, for, say, my fair share on my rights, the de debt that I'm... Uh, unless we went at it at as a whole total group to take care of all the debts of everybody, then we're going to have to do it individually. Well, but this is just a notice, right? Yeah, notice of acknowledgement of the debt, yeah. And uh, we talked about this a little bit last week, that we might want to notice the, the public side and the private side. So who would be the main entities that we would want to notice on that? Well, I would give all three branches of government notice on that, executive, administrative, and uh, judicial. Do they operate all three branches on both sides? Uh, well, we are the, the uh, on the private side, we are the... We are the law. Yeah, uh, on the public side, and we just give notice on the public side of all three branches corresponding. What about to the private side of the treasury maybe given notice since there is a... Yeah, they all work under there. everybody else, you know, although they, they're saying that they're, you know, running the whole show, but, you know. I'm going to, uh, you know, give notice to the Secretary of State, the Secretary of, uh, uh, I mean, the Governor, say, the, the uh, all, all three branches are the Governor, Secretary of State, and the uh, Attorney General. Going to do that in the state, going to do that in the United States. The notice is just basically going to say uh, uh, that we're coming forth uh, to acknowledge debt, pay our fair share on it, put a, a stoppage on the, on the prescription of our... Yeah, that acknowledgement of debt will also have with it an order for settlement. Oh, even on the notice? Yeah, I'm going to put a, well, a one-two in there. One would be acknowledgement of the debt, and two would be the order for settlement. Would we send a non-negotiable instrument at that time? or? Uh, non-negotiable. Non non-negotiable is a debt instrument puts you right back under the United States and statutes and codes, and you just commingled your funds and your trust. Did you say non-negotiable or non-negotiable? Did you say non-negotiable or negotiable? No, I said non-negotiable. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, you're right. Excuse me. I thought you said negotiable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, non, we would send a non the non-negotiable instrument is really the merging of the titles because that order, order to merge the titles, that is likened to the BOE. That is likened to a a negotiable instrument. Okay. Section one fifty nine, one fifty nine in Gilbert. The, okay. the merging of the title is what pays the bill. It's payment, right? And what are we merging two titles of? Well, the titles to the debt with the titles of the assets. So the merging of those two titles is the payment. That's okay. the charge on one side and the set-off on the other side during an account settlement. The prescription is the debts and the order to merge is the assets. Uh, yeah, the, that's like the a bill of exchange is, everybody thinks a bill of exchange are also known as a check or a draft, 
they think that's money. No, that's not money. That's an instruction to take two bills and exchange them one for the other. Bill of exchange. You're exchanging two bills. We're like exchanging two titles here, merging two titles. Title for the debt, title, title to the asset. Put the title to the debt set, and I'll put the, the order uh, pay him up. Yes. Christian, I um, my phone's a little bit messed up. Um, said uh, we're merging the titles of the debt with the titles of the what? Assets. Thank you. And then we're going to call it Treasury Directive 25-06 in the IRS Treasury, and we're going to use that as the individual master file to do an administrative procedures a dip hearing and give them all the records that they need that and the orders that that terminates those trust accounts. Now that's all going to be on this first notice. No, the 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 first notice will just be the acknowledgement of the debt and the order for settlement. Okay. It'll be the estoppel for the agreement that there's a debt that is owed. We're going to agree with them, which creates no controversy now. Now there's no no reason to come forth with a foreclosure or an arrest. I'm, I'm going to agree that I am a debtor and I'm going to pay the debt, but, you know, now there's no agreement. Now there's no case. Now I'm not an enemy. I'm agreeing to pay my debts. And right in that notice, I'm agreeing to pay my debts with an order to merge. Uh, well, that would come next. Okay, that would come next. Uh, I'm just giving them an order for settlement, but first they've got to give me a bill. You know, what, what is the amount that is, that is due? You know, tell me what the title to the debt is. If not, you know, I'll give you a carte blanche order to merge it with an equal amount of whatever is in the asset side of the trust. Take it out of that, merge the title up in there, and terminate the whole thing. That way there's no outstanding obligation. I'm looking at, like, the dishonor on a 9-210 and the estoppel on the under B where and E also, where they have a duty to file a termination statement, quote-unquote, or a letter that there is, quote, no outstanding obligation, and then a failure to file a termination statement and fail uh, to give you a notice of an identified assignee by 9-208 with the names and addresses there to under 9-625. So show me under 9-206, number one, the delivery, the two, the assignment, the three, the agreement, or else bug off as a buyer of an account as the debt collector. Same thing. Anything else? Anybody? Um, where's Jason? Christian, uh, where's Hi. Doug? Yeah, Doug. I just thought about, well, I've seen the, the Matrix again recently on TV. And thought just crossed my mind now, because you had said that it could only take one to pay the debt. Right. And I'm just wondering if the Wachowski brothers were trying to tell us that. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> you know, they know a lot what's going on, and it, it just kind of struck me that Neo means one. And yeah, right. He did it. He stopped the war and made the peace and paid the debt. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to um, make a comment about what that gentleman just said. Go ahead. Okay. You know, I uh, was, uh, Doug, were you talking about um, the national debt? Is that what you were talking about? The whole show, yeah. Um, you know, I, I've i given that a lot of really, really serious thought. And I try to look at things from every single possible angle, over, sideways, you know, back and forth and everything. And, um, you know... And I came to two conclusions, and, you know, anybody who, who doesn't agree with it is fine, because I absolutely respect everybody's opinion. But um, after thinking about it, I realized um, that would take away free will. You know, there's there's people like my mother in this world who love pain bills, and uh, she's a, a diehard Bush fan. She's got pictures with them, and um, that would just not fit into her black and white world. There is no gray. I don't know. I must be adopted. I'll just <laughs> I'll just put it that way. And number two, um, uh, basically, I believe that if the, if the national debt was paid off and everybody was forgiven, that, um, you know, I wouldn't bring this up if I didn't feel really strongly about it, but I, I feel that every single murderer, child molester, um, rapist would be free and walking amongst us. So, I mean, that's just my take on it, and I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, but under common law, they can't get out. Interesting. Yeah, we have multiple law forms. Yeah, depending on what 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 your venue is, where you're playing. What you know, if you go out and murder somebody, you're subject under the common law. You ain't getting out. You may pay the debt under the statutes and codes, but that doesn't pay the obligation. It's still due under the common law. You can still go to prison for that. There is no value set on that under common law, under statutes and codes. If there are for the fiction, but not for the real man. You break the law under the common law as a real man. You're going to have a heck of a time getting out of jail. 
We don't live in a lawless society, not on the Republic. Well, that right there, that right there would, would make me feel a lot more comfortable. I mean, that right there. But also, you know. just like in the Matrix, the people, the, the guy asked at the end how long it would last, and the, you know, the Oracle said as long as it can. The people have, have a free will still; they can go back into death. Just like the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were finally freed, but some of them wanted to go back. Yeah, they're like well, they leaks. Ninety-nine point nine 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 percent will if they don't if they don't know Christian Walters well, that they will go back into debt and commingle and all that. Well, isn't that where under the Republic we would just we we would just have to outlaw usury? We can't allow private banks to to operate. We don't need banks. We are back. Right. Well, that's, uh, you know, I love I love that story where Jesus ran the money changers from the temple, you know. Well, the early church, they, in Acts 2 and 4, they didn't charge anybody anything. They set up an economy based on love. There was no charging, and they set us an example. We need to set up a no-charge economy. That sounds like the Venus Project. You ought to Google it. It looks beautiful. I don't see where there'd be any place, like like total barter system, and I, I, don't, I don't think there'd be any room for um, these attorneys and money. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 defines where the accounts are and how to use it. Paul says everybody's got an account that they owe, and it's based on your giving. Your account that you owe is based on your giving? Or the, the amount of money in your account is, is based on your giving. What you give is what oh. you're going to receive. Right. Okay, I got you. Philippians 4 is the model for that. Have, have you guys ever listened to any of Gordon Hall's audios? Uh, yeah, I've listened to some of them, yeah. Well, as you know, he spent darn near a decade in lock, locked up. But I was listening to a little bit of his stuff today, and, you know, for a guy that had been locked up for that long, he, he really thinks our form of government and everything is perfect, and that you can get remedy if you know what you're doing. And uh, he seems to have done a pretty good job of it. <laughs> so it's uh, pretty inter you know, his paradigm is pretty interesting, how he can navigate through this stuff without, you know, I'm not saying without any obstacles, but that if done right, as he says, knowing who we are, that they will they will basically submit to our authority. But they'll put us through the ringer to, to uh, make us, I guess, yeah, prove that we're worthy of it. Heard that, you know, the, the average person can't attain the... Uh, the degree of professionalism, you know, and, and the knowledge to get to that point. It's like training for the Olympics. We have to be such of a high caliber to clear all the hurdles. And if you miss one, you, you're out, period. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, quite stacked against us, that's for sure. I don't, I, I couldn't say that it's really fair, but, you know, but anyway, that was just, that's just one man's paradigm, one man's view, and I just... I really don't want to go back in and operate on their stage under their debtor-creditor uh, stuff. I want to pull the whole rug out from the whole thing. Well, I agree wholeheartedly with you that, you know, that that's what should be done. We shouldn't have to operate under their any of their constraints or, you know, black magic, whatever, fiction. Like I said, I think the House Joint Resolution has been, you know, abused for the fact that the relief valve has been kept closed. And that was the, the remedy valve, which would actually allow us to do the, the set off and the discharge and relieve the, the debt to where it's down to more imaginable levels. Now, in their fiction realm, they can't do without debt because debt's what they're using as money. But let's not have it all attached to people who are acting as real parties as being sureties. And then let's not have the prison system set up for profit. <laughs> yeah. So well, there's some side that would work with a debt, uh, system a fiat currency system in place if some of the things that they're doing were just straightened out. And then if we had our hands on the relief valve as we the people so that we could bring it down through any crisis to get us past the crisis point and then level the thing back up at the manageable levels again. Yeah, if we can if we can control the flow of currency, then that that's fine. That's, that's how they create all this stuff is they pump up the economy and then they turn off the tap. But the only reason why they're controlling the currency and all this stuff is because we, the people, fell asleep and let them do it the way they wanted to. And we have the kind of government that we deserve because that's what we decreed, our silence. Well, that yeah, that's true. But I guess why the Americans were being industrious and building and doing and what they were doing, the the. The ones that have always been a parasite have created, like money, something, you know, man's only creation is money. Uh, well, that they, and they, the wars that wore us out 
so that we all we wanted to do was go play and have a rest and have a good time. And then we didn't right, that's pay what attention to doing government. So I was back down to the same situation again. I really don't want to point a finger at them. I want to point a finger at myself. I'm, I'm the first culprit, and I'm guilty. I agree. I mean, we, we got to take responsibility. I'm just saying, it's funny how when we were, our forefathers and everything were being industrious and trying to grow and build and do things, their their whole pl plan was, how can we, you know, usurp all their energy and power? So, well, when the bulk of yeah, it got out of government, then it became very easy for them to manipulate government the way they wanted to, and then it all crumbled from there. So let's let's start taking it back, folks. It all starts with knowing it's about a trust and understanding it's a trust, and the remedy is not in debtor credit relationship as secured party credit. The remedy is in trust. It's commerce through trust and equity. We're really moving titles and trust, functioning as commerce. Oh, I guess it's getting kind of late. So. Well, well said. Has it, do, you, do any of you guys go to the Benjamin Fulford site and or this uh, global analysis site with uh, what's his name, Christians, uh, and read about what's kind of happening with uh, maybe the, the the Fed and some other political intrigue that's going on? No, I haven't. No. Yeah, pretty for some pretty interesting stuff that uh, is going has been going on with. Uh, since Obama's uh, executive order to bring Interpol in and, uh, you know, clean up some of the Bush, Clinton, you know, Rockefeller crime family stuff and pay back a bunch of money in restitution and, uh, yeah, uh, trying to get on to that. Uh, somebody was just telling me today about Obama making mention of discretionary programs. Now, was he liking in that until uh, uh, unto the discretionary trust? Oh, I, I don't know. So I think there are colorable terms that they're using. He was probably saying that they're, you know, without making too much truth, you know, discretionary programs. I think he was likening that until the discretionary trust. Anyway, well, it's uh, time to close up shop. See you all. Thank you very, tomorrow. very enlightening. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you all tomorrow at the uh, 8 o'clock. No, 10 o'clock on Tuesday. That's right. Same number. Fantastic. See, see everybody then. Thank you, Kristen. Or we'll see you on Wednesday yep. at 8 o'clock. So remember, check out the website. Uh, should be here pretty shortly. I'll have up those audio links up there. So unless I got a snack. Okay. Thank you, Christian. Good night, all. All right. Night.